Analysis matters, and we're gonna, our theme is theory to reality. So you're going to hear a lot about the theory and how it's supposed to work, but if any of you actually work in projects, reality can sometimes be a little different than the theory. So um, let's start with a little introduction. My name is Michelle Johnston. Um, piled higher and deeper. That's what that next piece is there. Um, I actually have a background in technology. I've worked in many um, technology companies. Uh, I've also worked in technology in high, the higher ed space, and I've worked as an enterprise architect, and then I kind of also have a lot of background in the business side of the organization, and I have a doctorate actually that focuses on management decision making, and I do a lot of work now with large programs on the people side of the people process technology issue, and as was mentioned this morning by Carlos, I have never seen a project that failed because of technology but I have seen many that hit some significant challenges because of the people side. So, hi everybody, my name is Nina Maddox, um, with Accenture as well, I'm a senior manager out of our Sacramento office. Um, so I live right here, actually, just north of here in the city with my family. Um, I work in our health and public service strategy group, and so, uh, like Michelle, I do have a, both a technical and a business background. And um, in recent years, I've been focusing on helping organizations develop their business case for change, uh, helping them measure their financial and operational performance as a result of that change. And it's been a great deal of fun, both on the public service side as well as in the private sector. So we're really looking forward to, to seeing you all here today. I also might add that while we don't have time to do introductions around this room, uh, we recognize it and appreciate that this is a great opportunity for all of you coming together here today to meet your colleagues and peers uh, in other departments and agencies. And so as we go through the session today and you have an opportunity to ask a question or share some insights, that you would also introduce yourself um, with your name and, and perhaps what organization you belong to and what role you play there, that'll at least get some introductions out throughout the day. Okay. So our session objectives, as um, Michelle said, our, our course is called uh, uh, Why Business Analysis Matters. And it was funny because as we were working on this for the last several months actually with input from public service uh, uh, representatives from different agencies uh, to figure out what would be most valuable, valuable to present today, um, we realized, goodness, we have you know, less than two hours today now. Um, and there are entire volumes of information written on business analysis and entire institutes that have been established around uh, you know, methodologies and things. And so we really wanted to focus today on some, some key sort of uh, uh, best practices, leading practices, uh, some things that you might be able to take away to apply to your perhaps your current pro projects, perhaps your future projects. But think of it more of a, as a 101 because there's such a broad spectrum of people in this, in this uh, room today that we wanted to make sure that the content was relevant and it wasn't too high of a level but that we didn't have enough time to deep, you know, do a deep dive. So this will be a starting point for discussion and then we're happy to talk with you in more detail. Michelle and I will be in the booth today, later today at the Accenture booth. So let's start with the common challenges. And our slide only allowed for nine boxes. <laughs> so I'm sure that we could probably think of some more and you're probably thinking of some other challenges that you have experienced um, in your roles, whether it was on project delivery roles or just in day-to-day -day business, um, of how business analysis, technology coming together, uh, just the pressures of trying to balance across cost, time, uh, resources, um, it can be really challenging, right? And so we wanted to just kind of bring up some challenges that we typically see um, when doing big transformation uh, or change programs. And then talk a little bit about how do we address some of these? 
it may not be solving them, but at least reducing the risk of them occurring. And so we're going to talk about some of those best practices. But as you look up here by a show of hands, have you experienced any of these? Yes, right? Yeah. So we're going to talk about some of those. Um, in particular, you know, it's interesting because sometimes you'll be on a project and, um, or, you know, any kind of an endeavor that requires business analysis, and it's actually uh, sometimes uh, it's referred to as an optional step, if you will. Um, we can skip that part, right? We've already done that part in the, in the RFP. We've already sort of, you know, figured that out um, in terms of what our needs are. So we don't really need to document those business requirements again, do we? Do we really need to ask of them, meaning the business? And yes, we do. And I think that's uh, something that we'll talk through today. Um, the other thing is sometimes requirements get lost in translation between IT and the business, or the business and IT. Um, sometimes the business might uh, ask for a solution that actually doesn't address the true business need. Um, and so no. we, <laughs> we may build something that um, doesn't address perhaps the, the, the core key drivers that were uh, established in the beginning. Um, and then what about those stakeholders? This one down here. Do we know who our stakeholders are? Do the stakeholders know who they are? <laughs> and do they know what role they're, they're playing in the successful uh, project delivery? And how do we engage with those stakeholders? How do we uh, uh, bring them along in that change journey? And Michelle's got great experience in that. We'll be talking about that today. So what is business analysis? I'll give you just a second to read that. So this is a very academic definition, right? <laughs> Textbook definition, right, out of the Institute of Business Analysis. But what does that really mean in our day-to-day, -day, right, as business analysts? And by a show of hands, uh, just first, the first question I have is, how many of you are actually, your role title is something along the lines of business analyst? Okay, quite a few. And how many of you don't have a role of business analyst in your job title, but you actually perform business analysis as well. It's interesting, so great. That's very common, right? Um, business analyst as a role is fairly new in the last you know, several years, but um, it's becoming more and more a critical component. So this very academic definition is interesting, but what does it mean in our day-to-day? -day? Well, we need to understand sort of several things. We need to understand as a business analyst, what are the business opportunities or problems that we're trying to address first, right? Then we need to understand what is the context that we're working in. And by context, I mean what is the business environment, what business decisions have been made, perhaps, that would affect you know, the solution that we um, architect later on in the process. Uh, what are the, it could be a legislative uh, envir you know, environment, a new statute or a law. Um, that we need to be mindful of. It could be a technological environment. Perhaps there's been an investment in that the state's made something that the departments now need to plug into. So we need to understand that context, right? I'm seeing some nodding heads, right? Um, so that's the business context in the background that we need to be able to clearly identify it as analysts. Um, then we need to understand and identify those stakeholders. Again, those project sponsors and those stakeholders. So that's hugely important. Um, and we need to understand how to change an organization and bring them along in a journey. And by change, that could mean, you know, changing by processes, maybe creating new processes or updating processes or improving them. It could be people, organizationally, how are you going to change uh, to produce the results that you're after to drive that business value. And then third, technology. What technology is going to enable that change to happen? And so as a business analyst, you kind of need to bring all of those pieces together uh, to drive toward business value. So that's the, that's the real definition <laughs> of what's behind these words, I think, or one offer of that. Okay? So how many of you are project managers or program managers? Okay. So one of the things that people often ask is, what's the difference between what a business analyst does and what a project manager does? And so the reason that there is confusion is both roles are driving to the same goal. Mm -hmm. So a project manager wants to make sure that you meet the business needs of your department, your division. That's their, their goal. And then the business analyst wants that same thing. However, 
what they bring to the table is different and what they're cast with is different. So the business analyst is all about understanding the needs of the business. That's the team that they're representing. That's what the role they're playing in the team. The project manager is responsible for planning, managing, and delivering a solution that was oftentimes a part of that early scoping process that took, you know, five years to get together. And they're being held accountable for that. So there are natural points of tension between those two roles. If you look at what the, the two roles, and, I, and I'll let you read, I won't read it for you, you can see that although there are, they're often touching the same information, they're responsible for different parts of it, or they play different parts. And I'll talk about stakeholders for a good example. The project manager is responsible for identifying who are the stakeholders in this project. They usually come together, they have a list of the stakeholders, that's often a role that they play. On the other hand, the role of the business analyst is to create a connection. They play that liaison between the business, those stakeholders, and the project teams, the IT team, and so on. So when you look at these different roles, there are points that they come into conflict. That's natural. If everybody's doing their job well, there's going to be points of tension. So one of the important things when you're starting a program and you're working as a business analyst and you're a good program manager is before you get very deep into it, decide how you are going to resolve the conflicts that <coughs> will happen. Because those places where he's representing what's important, and this is the discussion, you know, this was scoped four years ago, and actually our solution is slightly different than what we actually thought it was going to be, and now the changes have happened because of this new legislation, and so we actually have to change. And the project manager is saying, I have this budget, I have this scope, I have this timeline. What you're talking about really pushes things out in a way that's not going to work. So how do you deal with that? You deal with that by knowing it's going to happen and thinking up front, how will we solve those conflicts? How will we resolve it? One of the ways that I like to do it is early in a project, be very, very clear, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. What are the imperative things that you must do in this project? Smart people on projects can come up with more ideas than you can possibly do in the scope or time of any project. Mm -hmm. You have to say, what are the things, the four or five things that we absolutely must get done, prioritize them, and then when new ideas come up or important things come up or things that you have to look at as requirements come up, oh, turn on the mic. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> That's so irritating. All right. Um, I hope you got that on film and tape. Um, when, and see, now I can't even remember what I was talking about. <laughs> so once you have that information and you know what's imperative, when new ideas come up, have a process where you all agree, this is how we're going to prioritize. One of the things I like to do is what I call a Moscow list. Anybody ever hear of that? Moscow? It's just a way of remembering what must we have, what should we have, what could we have, and what won't we have. And you look at your requirements that way, and you say, is this something, you look at our impaired, must we have this? Should we have this if we have enough time? Could we have it if suddenly money fell in our lap? Mm -hmm. And is this something that's not going to be happening? So get that decided up front. Essential skills, when you're looking at a business analyst, if you're looking to hire, you know, one of the things I often hear from teams is, well, we really can't afford that because we can't get MBAs. Okay, that's just... You know, MBAs, like PhDs, are entertaining at parties, but they're really not that important. What's really important in a good business analyst is that they understand the day-to-day -day work of a department. They know how things actually work. This means that managers are often not very useful in this role. And I'm not saying that to be funny, but oftentimes the management knows how they think it should work, or maybe even how they believe it works, but the reality is that the people who really know how it works may not be in the management role. Management has a lot of things they're doing. They're, they have their own budgets and so on. The people who are actually doing the work. So a good business analyst understands how things actually work, and they understand why. So that person, I often say, when you're looking for a good business analyst, look in your functional group and look for the person who the funky tech. In other words, the person who really understands the function and likes technology. They're the person who sometimes is a super user on existing systems. They really like the technology. They are not threatened by technology. They're not necessarily <coughs> the person who came out of the IT shop, but they're somebody who really gets it and enjoys it. If they don't enjoy it, they're not going to be good at it. You can also find good business analysts on the IT side, but they also have to like the business side. They have to enjoy that. They have to 
be able to make that connection in the business side and really understand how it works and why it's happening. And then be able to think creatively how to use this technology, this solution to solve challenges here. When you're looking for people to fill this role, you want to find people that above all are curious. Because there's not always a clear path to analyzing a business situation or a business need. And then you want to find people who can connect well with other people. So someone who says, I really like working in the network room by the server because it's cold and dark, <laughs> probably not the person for this job. You want somebody who likes to connect to people and enjoys that, and isn't daunted by what is the inevitable frustration of this kind of role, because you're often in a place where there's conflict. So they have to be somebody, I would say, I always tell my team, no drama, no trauma. The project itself has that. If you bring it into the project, mm -hmm. you're just making things worse for everybody. So people who can reduce trauma and drama are really good. Okay, so just to sum it up, what you're looking for is business understanding and technical understanding, and when those two come together, magic happens. Well, it's probably not actually magic, but it is high value for you because you really can think critically about what is valuable and really, really important in big projects and big transformations. What is perhaps valuable but not today that we can push off for later. So, enough of us talking. We're going to do a little exercise. On your table is a reprint of this so you can see it. Um, so, thinking about yourself as if you're the business analyst, you're in the business and you go to the side, there's actually two exercises. So, we're going to start with the one with the pretty boxes on it. Um, think about a project that you're either working on now or you have in the past and what are, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the things that went really well, and choose one or two of these topics to discuss with the team at your table, and take a minute to introduce yourselves to so you know who's sitting near you. So we're going to give you about 10 minutes, and we'll, we'll put a timer on. Hi. <laughs> okay. Sorry to take some time to your conversation. Yeah, Hopefully you all like had a chance to discuss some good uh, topics on your tables and perhaps even do a few introductions. Um, so, does anybody want to volunteer and share what has worked well uh, in their experience? Any good stories? Dan, 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 Okay, great. I forgot what I said. No, <laughs> what? <laughs> What, what, what and, and your name is Dan, we know that. But I've said when you have smaller groups and you can have a team that you can identify your tech experts in your business group and you can rely on them to bridge some of that gap. And as long as up front you identify your important terms, then you can move forward without each person expecting different things when a certain term comes up. Really good point, and that gets to that uh, translation. Okay. I, I, I just add that real quick. Uh, my name is Lisa, and where are you from? Uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. What worked for us um, in the last large project that um, I was on was we had um, working groups from each of the SDLC. So, you know, one or two and we'd get together and we would do our jazz sessions in that format. And that seemed to really help as far as communications because we all communicate differently. And so it did help us Great. some Great. possible misunderstandings. Great. I saw a few more hands on what works well. Yes? I, I work for the Department of Water Resources and we have a, we just recently implemented a formal project intake methodology and the first key thing that is really helping us to become more successful is we assign a business analyst, a project manager, um, a lead technical team from our architecture, and then work with the business side. And, and that seems to be working better. Great. Great. OK, well, let's talk about uh, what hasn't worked so well. Not everybody on the one. <laughs> Challenges. Any challenges that you want to share? Sure, go ahead. When, when, oh, Pat Valencia Carlson from Department of General Services on the Fiscal Project. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at a past department, I found in a couple IT projects, if the, as a business user, when the IT people think they have a vision of how it's going to work and then won't come 
uh, that's it. That's how it's going to work, and it doesn't really matter <laughs> what the <laughs> business needs are or if they've changed. Or that's that's a problem. That's a, that's a great example. We're going to try to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit today about um, how important it is to align uh, the vision of both the strategic plan of your department or agency or maybe even the state um, with the, the business and technology and IT so that you're all driving for the same thing. That's great. Anybody else want to share anything? Or? I think one of the big things for us is the where are you at? Where are you from? I'm, I'm Patty. I'm from the Um And because one of the things I, she talked about was, uh, and I think the problem we have is the business, the line between business and technology. <laughs> Even though she was for the MV, she just said SDLC and JADS. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are things that a lot of people, I'm a policy manager, I, I manage a group of business policy analysts, and a lot of times they say, okay, give us your business rules, and we have a liaison group called that, they're called registration automation, and they are the people that will turn our document into something that the IT folks can understand. Uh -huh. But a lot of times it will come back to us, and, and uh, we're not telling us that want. So there's this language barrier that we need to park. You know, so. I can totally uh, sympathize, with, or sympathize with that, because at Accenture we use <laughs> way too many acronyms, too, and we have don't have to actually document that so that we all speak the same language so uh, so great thank you for sharing that I hope that was helpful to kind of talk through those questions um, so in this next section or part of the session what we're going to walk through or uh, you know this slide is going to become very familiar to you because we're going to anchor back to this as we continue to move through the materials today um, you know there's there's different subject matters different pieces of business analysis shown here um, but this is not exhaustive by any means. I mean, there's much more to business analysis than what is shown here. Um, and I also want to point out that this is not a linear approach by any means. Business analysis is very much iterative. Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the, the life cycle of a program and, and where business analysis happens. Um, so this shouldn't be thought of as linear. It's very much iterative. Um, but as we move from left to right, um, you'll find that we'll, we'll call that out again and again as a key message. So let's start with this, uh, the business case itself. So have people in this room worked on feasibility study reports, FSRs? Yeah, you've done those before? Well, I had, had to do my homework and learn all about FSRs. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, part of that process, right? You have to uh, try to answer the question uh, for the Department of Technology and to the Department of Finance is this worth investing in? Um, what's the compelling business case? Why should we do this? Especially if you're in an environment of um, you know, budgetary constraints, uh, those asks need to be prioritized. Um, and they should be driven by business need. And we're gonna continue to you know, say that again and again, is business value and business need should be at the center of that. Um, and I know the Department of Technology is gonna be rolling out some some information on that as well and bringing that to the center and driving from business need. So as you're trying to answer that question or find the answer to that question, is this project something that the state should invest in, um, you know, you're going to be looking at first, again, your business problem or objectives. You know, what is it that we're trying to solve from the business's point of view? Um, and then, you know, how do we measure success? How do we define what those metrics are? How are we going to define the business drivers, if you will? If it's a revenue enhancement project, maybe for a tax agency, or if it's a cost reduction um, effort, um, you know, name any kind of function in the business in terms of operations and management for cost reduction. Um, it could be a service level uh, improvement. Uh, it could be internal service to your internal customers within um, your agencies or departments, or it could be the citizens that you're serving. Uh, perhaps it's cycle time or um, processing time for an application or something like that. Do any of those sound familiar, of course? So that's what you're trying to do in the business case. And what I wanted to emphasize here is not so much building that initial case, because I think if you have any experience with doing the FSR process, you're able to sort of quantify what's my one-time capital investment going to be in terms of software, hardware, um, you know, fees to, to implement the software. Um, and then your recurring costs, of, you know, your run costs, you can identify those, right? So if there's any license fees or things like that to operate the solution afterwards, you can, you know, come up with those numbers um, through various ways. 
And then you're going to talk about what are the benefits, right? So if it is an uptick in revenue, um, how do you sort of um, ramp that, you know, once the solution's in place? How do you show that over fiscal years? I might say that, you know, things are typically done in fiscal years, but if you look at it a bit more granular, you know, at a quarter level, um, it can sometimes be helpful to plan at that quarter level um, to really see how that ramp works. Um, you know, as you assess that, uh, it's important that, um, you know, once you come up with, okay, this is what your, you know, in the private sector you call it sort of return on investment, right? But there's an earned analysis worksheet, is that what it is, that sort of shows what that ramp is and what your payback period is? Um, that's great. The, the important point, though, is that it's important to keep that business case a living document so that once that actually gets approval, hopefully, and you move to implementation, that that business case is then where you anchor back to make sure that you're actually hitting what you had envisioned in terms of recurring costs, recurring benefits, et cetera. And so um, one of the things that I like to recommend when I do business cases uh, at the front end of a project is you actually build into that business case, and we'll talk about this later, um, what I call value events. And that's like a trigger, if you think about it as a trigger. So uh, it's something that drives that business value. So say your business driver was to reduce cost of uh, maintaining uh, a data center, for example. Um, and so if you're able to decommission servers as part of your implementation, or you're even able to close a data center as a result of your implementation, that is an event that's going to create value for the business. It can be quantified. It can be measured. And so you would put that in your business case along with a timing. And then when you build your work plans, your project plans, you actually put those in as milestones. And then you march toward those milestones and have a view of when that value is actually going to occur. And we'll talk more about that in benefits realization. There's a lot I could talk about in business cases, but uh, we don't she have. She loves that. <laughs> OK. So enough of that. No, not that. So, Let's talk a little bit about another piece, and remember this isn't linear, but the stakeholders, the people part of people process technology. And this is a place where sometimes it's called change management. Um, and there, there are interesting responses to this, but a common response is, I don't need no stinking change management. <laughs> and it's interesting because you would never take on a big project and say, uh, you know what, I really i am going to leave out the whole technical analysis, and I'm just going to just kind of jump in there. <laughs> Or I'm not going to redesign the processes. I'm just going to let them happen. Um, the people side of that process, again, as I said before, can be a really, really challenging one. So thinking about your stakeholders and how are you going to manage the effort with your people that are impacted. And the first piece in that is identifying who are your stakeholders. There's a million ways to do this. Um, there, but pretty much any approach you're going to take is going to start with identifying who are the stakeholders. Um, and that's people who may be actually involved in the project, that may be constituents, that may be people who actually are consumers of the service that your division or department provides. And you want to think about who's going to be impacted by this work, because that's going to give you information about how do we know that we're making the right decision when we look at, is this, a, is this really a requirement that we do now, or is this something that just, you know, Sally always likes a red button on her screen, and, and so we're going to put a red button for Sally. Um, the other thing you have to do that everybody really loves is you have to write this down. You have to document it. You're going to refer to this again and again. Uh, if you do it well at the beginning, it will be something that you will have to do over and over again because your stakeholder groups will change, you'll discover more people, and so on. But then once you have decided who's out there, you want to think about it from an analytical point of view. Who are these people? Who are these groups of people? What are they like and how are they going to react to this particular project? Don't spend a lot of time asking people the question that I hear a lot of people who are theoretical about change management do. How do you feel about this change? How are you feeling about it? <laughs> Let me say to you days and weeks. They feel bad. They feel really, really bad, and they don't like it. Human beings do not like to change. And I know because I actually got two brains this morning. Yes, I was the blue person. I don't know what just seemed. Red, white, I can blue. <laughs> So people are going to feel bad, and the whole point of managing the, the stakeholder group is recognizing that change is difficult for humans. They don't like it. Even people who like to change don't like change when it happens to them. Mm -hmm. 
And so you want to be able to plan for it. You want to be able to support people through it. You want to be able to get to the end and actually have human <laughs> beings that want to work wherever it is that you've created this fabulous solution and who know what to do and aren't fighting you every way, every step of the way. And then you want to manage it and it changes over time. So you can't just come up with a plan and go, I'm done. You have to change it as you go along. Whatever approach you use, you're going to be looking at something that's like this. You have human beings and you want to move them along some kind of a curve of change. You want to start with making people aware that change is even happening and then you want them to understand what it means and you'd like them to accept it and then maybe some of them, not all of them by the way, you want them to be committed to it. You want them to be able to help you move it forward. Not everyone will get to that point. If you don't have some kind of a process to do this, you end up with the counterpoints. Instead of people being aware, they just become confused. Instead of people understanding it, they just get a negative perception. This is a terrible project that's going to wreck everything I've built for the last 20 years. Um, instead of accepting it, they're going to actually start resisting. And once you get that going on the business side of your project, your project is going to be extremely expensive. It's going to be unsuccessful. Your requirements are going to be wrong. Because the people who have the information aren't going to be on board with you. Um, as you're doing this, there's lots of pieces. And again, this could be like a whole week-long or longer course in change management. Yes? Can we ask on, on the previous slide, what are some of your strategies or tips to, to make that curve sharper? Because on fast-track projects, many times the project is finished and you're still going through that change commitment curve, which is kind of gradual. And you want to make that curve. So this, this, this. Well, if we made, I can make it. I can make it steeper by making this shorter, right? So this, there's not. I'm not saying this is three. Maybe this is two weeks. <laughs> if it's two weeks, you're not going to get a lot of commitment. So it depends on the size of the project. But I absolutely can. And in fact, that's what this is about. You have certain levers that you can pull. So depending on what you're trying to do, and I'll get right to you. And depending on what you're trying, like you want people to be aware. This is where communications is really important. A lot of people think change management. That's communications. That's a part of it. That's one lever that you pull. That's how you help people understand, know what's happening, but be aware of it. When you start to try to grow understanding of it, you have to have a measurement piece in place. Because if you're not measuring it, you have no concept. Do people, are they understanding or not? And then what else do I need to communicate if they're not? So you have to introduce that to get to that next piece. To get to the next one where people are starting to accept it, you've got to get your leadership on board. And the leadership actually has to start building into the organization what I call a change network of people who are going to help move the change within the organization itself. And then what you want to do is look at what are all the things I need to gain commitment. And that's where you're looking at how do I help this workforce move? How am I going to get people trained? How am I going to get people who are in this team understand where's my, where's my career path? Where do I go here? I know, I know COBOL better than anybody, but now what do I do? Where do I go? What is my path? So those are the levers that you plan for and pull to move forward. Yes. Um, I managed a group of cross-functional, mm -hmm. per se, functional animals. So the challenges that we have been having is the roles and responsibilities and change management. So I guess what I would help with is in organizational change management, is it project manager's role to manage this change, or is it business analyst's role? Great question. I will be at the booth all day. Come and talk to me and let's talk through that. Because that's a really, that's a common question. Who's going to do it? And the answer is everybody has to do it. You can't do it. It can't just be change management, project management separate, the management of the organization completely separate. You've got to build a team. But we can talk at length about that. So once, again, remembering these aren't linear, once you have a clear picture of what you're, you're trying to accomplish, and you've identified who's involved, one of the things that you're going to be doing is eliciting your requirements. And this is one of the places that can be really hard for a business analyst because of something that Nina mentioned. When you come into projects that have taken a long time to go through the review cycle and go through procurement and everything else, people may have, some of the people on the team may have the perception we have already done all of this. Here's our requirements. We wrote them down two years ago. What is the matter if you can't read? <laughs> and so one of the things you have to get by is that. Because yes, there may have been requirements two years ago. Who knows whether all of the legislation is the same? Who knows if the requirements, who knows if the solution you bought actually was what people were thinking at that time? So you really do have to go through a process of understanding, again, what's the business need and getting people constantly on the same page. What's, what are we trying to accomplish? 
What is imperative for us to do? And all the time, even though you're the business analyst, you need to be thinking, putting on the hat that the project manager has, which is don't be doing scope creep. If you're bringing something forward as a good business analyst, and you're saying this is something we really need to consider, before you take it forward for a change order, be sure that it is actually a requirement and not just a nice to have thing. Project managers have hard jobs. Yes? That's where one of our things was, is, um, since it was a, lar a long project, is, okay, you had all these requirements yes. two years ago, yep. and since the two years, now we have all these changes over here on hold, so how do you incorporate that versus somebody saying, that's out of scope, that's out of scope, that's out of scope? Great and question. And it caused... Yes. In the end, it caused, what, what does it cause? Just say it. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I know it. It causes overruns. It causes too much time. It causes expanding scope. This is why this is so important, even though you've gone through the process, to sit down and say, again, what are we going to do? What's our scope? And at the beginning, get clear on that again. And then have periods in your project where you actually revisit it and say, where are we? What's our timeline? Are there things we're going to have? That's why I like that must have, should have. Everything that's not a must-have can go. That's how you are, can, it's like, hey, when you first start, maybe you can do must-haves, should-haves, and could-haves. But as time goes on, the could-haves go away. There's something we're gonna do later on after we've gone live and everybody has survived. And then as you get closer and you're like, oh my gosh, some of those could-haves, and some of those should-haves go away. It's like, yeah, we should have them. We aren't gonna, not now. But remember, going live isn't the end of the, the universe. Going live is a starting point of improvement that goes with that. You also don't want to put blinders on and say everything. Absolutely you can't. Because it wasn't there because right. some of those things need to be. Considered. Absolutely. And the role of a business analyst is a tough one because you're constantly having to play that. And if you're in a small project, sometimes you are the project manager and the business analyst. And then you actually are having all this going on in your own head, which may require therapy. <laughs> um, but, but that's the reality. You have to, and I think a good business analyst always puts themselves, whether they're the project manager or not, if they're going to be any good at it, they listen to all those business requirements, they document it carefully, and then they step across the line and say, now if I was the person who had to hold the scope, hold the budget, and answer all the questions about where we are financially, would I still think this was important? And if the answer is yes, then they absolutely have to take that forward. Yes? Oh, I know in the in state, we tend to favor like a waterfall development process. Yes. Because we want to know all the numbers and all the costs and all the risks and everything all up front so someone will pay the bill. So absolutely. Go do your project. My organization has shifted to more of an agile methodology. Yes. And you're not going to know all the requirements up front. You will not. Scope creep is not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. In software, you actually don't know all the time what you want until you see something and you start playing with it. Mm -hmm. So Agile builds in mm -hmm. the idea that scope creep is going to happen. Yep. The difference is um, you've got to have an organization behind you that is willing to accept some of that. That's correct. And prioritize. Is schedule more important? Is the cost more important? Yes. Or is the scope more important? And if they say, hey, we're committed to Agile, then scope is one of those things that's going to flex. And so it's it's an interesting thing to do that paradigm of Agile in the state environment. It and is, and actually I have done it as well, and it is complicated if you're in a waterfall methodology to think through how do I do cycles Iteration. within that. Iterations. Yes, it is possible, but you're right, it's challenging. Please come to the booth. I'd love to talk about that. Awesome. So, designing and improving business processes. Is this still I me? I think that's still you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Designing and improving business processes. I'm not going to read all of the words in this slide. You, you'll have access to all of this. But the point is, when you're going through this effort, you really want to think about, just like you thought about the people, what's the process? Again, there's a million ways to do this, and they range from really slick, whiz bang technology that I've heard is supposed to work. I've never actually seen it work more than once. Um, which is you get a business process engine and you put your requirements in it and it mag magically spits out code on the other side and then the ERP system that you purchase works perfectly and then everybody changes the requirement and it works perfectly the second time. I've only seen the first time work, I've never seen the second time work. <laughs> but anyway, there's those. And then there's the methodology that is really not too cost prohibitive, which is taking a bunch of sticky notes and sticking them on the wall. Whether you're doing one that's very sophisticated or whether you're doing one with sticky notes, it's all the same process. And you want to think about some critical things. Where does our process begin? 
Where is it coming from? What agency? What constituent? Where is the information coming into us? Where is the information going out after us? You want to think about a process, not just within your little space, even if your space is big. Think about what's on the outside of either side, because that's going to give you a lot of information. And then think, where are my connections? Where are my integrations to other places along the route? And that gives you the framework to start with. And so if you had your notes on the wall, you could start right there. And then you want to think about, now, how can we make this better? How can we make it shorter? Are there steps that we can consolidate? That effort requires that you have a couple of groups in the session, somebody to do the sticky notes or the business process, process rules engine, but you also need to have people who really understand how the business works, and you also, also must have people understand the solution that you're going to use. And I've seen mistakes in both directions. But what I would say has worked really, really well is if you have a solution, if you've already chosen, let's say, an ERP system, have someone who can demonstrate how that ERP would do this function in its baseline format. So let's say it's, uh, let's say it's some application that allows people to get their benefits information online. Before you talk about how you do it today, because if you spend a lot of time documenting how you do it today, you end up with how you do it today, and then you configure a large expensive system to do what you do today, which is kind of crazy. Instead, have someone who knows how the system works show you, well, this is how it works. This is, OK, so I'm a constituent, or I'm a person that works in this department, and I log in here, and I get my information, and this is how I work. And then have this discussion. Is there a business reason that we can't use it just like that? And again, this is something to decide ahead of time. What are business reasons? It's a state law in California that we can't do it that way? That's a good business reason. It's a federal law that we can't do it that way? Really good reason and a thing to take back to the vendor and say, why are you selling software in this country? Um, <laughs> again, identify what are those things that are valid excuses, and I love to have them on the wall. And when people, say, and when people start having a discussion, have that discussion. This changes your business process analysis significantly. And then you can come up with extremely efficient approaches to your processes that also work with the solutions that you've purchased and not have to maintain incredibly complex integrations and configurations that may be hard to keep over time. Those costs up front of redesigning something, they're small compared to the difficulty, for those of you who work in IT, of maintaining those complex um, custom configurations or customizations over time. So. And now I think it is you. Business risk. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't know if uh, Michelle, uh, the one other point that I wanted to make around uh, the prior topic, um, improving business processes, is we have heard from um, the advisors that helped us put this course together that one of the things that um, really to emphasize is that you have an opportunity when you're building a new system or um, upgrading a system to do that process improvement. And when you have that, um, you know, whether you use a sticky note uh, way to do things or you have Visio diagrams and you have all of those processes there and you map them out, um, to look for those opportunities to actually make those very um, efficient or as efficient as possible. And that will go a long way. Um, because sometimes you find that, in fact, a technical solution isn't what you need at all. In fact, you just need some process reengineering to improve how the flow of information moves throughout your organization that could solve a lot of issues. So um, it's good to sort of incorporate that into, uh, into that business process review as well. So let's talk a little bit about assessing business risk. Um, you know, as part of the, uh, the initial um, planning and analysis on whether a project um, will be approved and, and back to the FSR process. Um, there's, a, there's a portion of that where you assess business risk, right? And I'm, I'm looking at you because you said that all of that must be known up front. <laughs> and then you sort of stamp it and put it away and then you know, we'll accept it again, right? But uh, the point is that um, you know, as you uh, think about risk, it can be different kinds of different types of risk. It can be internal to the organization and to the program and it can be external. So you have to think about both of those. And it can be uh, strategic risk. Um, it could be operational, um, financial um, in some cases. It can also be knowledge oriented. So you know, trying to retain talent or um, organizational risk, if you will. So we have to think about risk in different ways. 
risk can be positive, right? Um, but it, it can also have, uh, be a negative risk. And so you need to sort of be able to uh, put that into the context of, of what you're measuring. There's many different ways to measure risk um, when you're talking about requirements or, or um, situations that might occur during a project or a program. Um, and this is just one example. I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it, but we thought we'd just show one example of how you could do a scoring model. So on, on the one side, you have business importance, right? And what's the impact to the business? How important is it? And then down below, you have the probability. What's the likelihood that that risk will actually occur? And then by assigning a score to that, you can then create you know, a scatter diagram, if you will, um, across this four quadrants or two by two, and really kind of figure out, all right, what are my high impact to my business? What are my risks that are high impact to my business and high likelihood of occurring? Versus something that might be a low impact um, and a low likelihood of occurring. You still have to pay attention to these. And by the way, as the project moves forward and internal and external factors change because we live in a, in a moving world with different things changing both internal and external to the program, we have to revisit our risk assessment. And as business analysts, we play an important role in that to keep that risk assessment <coughs> active and part of the program so that you can go back to it and say, okay, what has changed from three months ago or six months ago? Um, has a, uh, a new statute uh, passed or, or law passed? We need to go back and, and figure out what that is and how that impacts us. Have requirements changed in such a way or business need have changed in such a way that it would change how we originally scored these situations. Um, and so again, you know, this is one way to do it. You could lay over this, um, you know, different kinds of uh, ways to, to score that and measure that. Um, but we thought we'd show one example today. And, and you all should get copies of all of this too um, provided. So let's move on to managing dynamic requirements. Keyword dynamic. <laughs> Yes, requirements are not static, right? Too bad, right? So as business analysts, we have to expect that. We really do. Um, we have to know that requirements are going to change from the business. Uh, we know that there are going to be new requirements that come up uh, for whatever reason. Um, we know that requirements will go away. And we also know that requirements will be updated or modified. Um, Meanwhile, solution is being developed, right? So uh, it's a lot to manage, no doubt about it. Um, the way that we kind of think about, and I think that's on the next slide, and I'll go back to that. The way that we think about this is, you know, if you, if you at the start of your program, you've elicited your requirements, you've worked with your stakeholders, you now know uh, what your baseline requirements are. You sort of save them and freeze them and put them into, sometimes we call them a traceability matrix or some sort of a tool, that's one way to do it. But the point is, is that you document it and you baseline it. This is what we did at the start of the project. We documented these business requirements and there they are. Now, as they are modified, deleted, or add, you know, you get additions, you can go back and trace back to the original requirements and not lose sight of them. It's, it's important here that my picture here uh, is, is really trying to draw out that these are requests. They're not necessarily, you know, yes, they're going to change, and yes, we're going to add these, or yes, we're going to delete these. These come in as requests, right? Change requests on a project. As you verify and validate that against the solution, what needs to remain at the center of that is the business need. Again, going back to ask the question, you know, must we have this? Is this addressing a business need? Is this going to help us deliver that value that we said in the original business case needed to be achieved? So constantly asking that question until we sound like a broken record, is this going to address a business need? And then, of course, this next slide, which has a lot of information on it, which we'll have is just sort of a flow. So again, you baseline the requirements and the scope. Business analyst and project manager working together, sometimes the same person, but you're freezing that scope. Then, as those change requests come in, you're evaluating those against business need. Resolving inconsistencies. This is very important, and that's why tracking those requirements is so uh, critical. Because 
if you have the two-year situation and you had requirements two years ago, and now you're sort of revisiting that and there's new things and new ideas coming through, you want to make sure that they're not conflicting with something that you've already documented um, or duplicative, right? So, you know, having a method to really trace and track that is hugely important for a business analyst. And then the change control process is just, you know, the governance around that. There needs to be people established up front that are the decision makers around this um, with the input from the business analyst team on whether this is really addressing business need and whether we need to hold scope or whether we need to expand scope to address something that's critical. And then finally, my yellow box down here, um, as requirements change and as they are approved, the business case must be updated if it's going to change your expected outcomes, right? Small changes may not move the needle, right? But if it's a big change, the business case needs to reflect that. Because ultimately your business case is not just your initial sort of evaluation of what the investment is, what the return is on that, but it's also your roadmap to achieving the benefit and the, and the value that you initially set out to achieve. Whether that be, again, it could be service levels, it could be cost reduction, it could be revenue enhancement, whatever that is, the business case will always be true to that. Okay? Okay, benefits realization. So this is simply tracking and measuring how are we doing. And, uh, you know, I talked earlier about value events. I want to just revisit that again and talk about what I mean by that. So a value event can be thought of as a trigger. It's something that causes value to occur. So if it's cost reduction and there's a, you know, maybe you're doing a strategic sourcing project and you're going to source supplies differently or you're going to consolidate vendors. Um, when that happens and those contracts go away, now you're sourcing, you know, paper supplies or something from one vendor, that's a value event. And so that's a time, time element tied to that where you're going to achieve that value. And you can then report on that on a scorecard or however you do it to make sure that your stakeholders and your sponsors understand on a regular and a consistent basis how you're achieving the original value of the case. So. This is another one of my favorite topics because I do this all the time for a living and I love to do this stuff, but it's great to see how a project achieves its initial um, vision uh, along the journey um, versus, you know, there's some approaches to look at a project at the end of it and then look back at the original case and say, how did we do? It's much more interesting, I think, to see it along the way. And it, and it also, uh, the other point I wanted to make on this slide is something called quick wins that we thought, talk about sometimes. Um, quick wins is a way to really, at the start of a program, especially if it's a cost reduction or a revenue enhancement program, to capture those quick wins. Um, so if something, you know, sometimes you'll get those quick benefits right up front, right? You're changing some processes, you're becoming more efficient, and you're realizing it, you're seeing it in your day-to-day -day business and operations, document those, bring those to the top so that they can be you know, collected and shared with stakeholders, with sponsors, with the team, because there's nothing like seeing um, you know, your value being realized quickly up front to build that momentum and you know, have the, the long charge of going through you know, a year long or 18 month long or two year project and continuing to build that momentum and seeing that light at the end of the tunnel going, yes, we're gonna do this. And I, I wanna tag on to that because you asked the question, like how do you move a team faster? And, and there was a discussion briefly about Agile. This is a place, even if you're doing kind of a waterfall methodology and your project's gonna take four years, if you identify upfront points of value and you hit them, that is a really huge boost to your stakeholders. Because they're not going to see, if you're not in the project team, you don't necessarily see what's happening, but if you can say, look, we have you know, saved this much money, or it used to take people four days to get this information, and now it takes two. That kind of information helps people to, to see a program as being something real, rather than wait four years and go, yes, we got the software in. So that's a huge way to get the people up that curve faster. OK, so you guys have at your tables copies of these. We did like a front back of these next two slides so you can take these with you. Um, 
This is just uh, the first one that has the green boxes on the ends and the maroon boxes in the middle, or box in the middle. Um, this is a typical right implementation timeline. I heard software delivery lifecycle, SDLC, I heard an acronym earlier, I think from DMV. <laughs> um, OMG. Okay, I'm not OMG. Down. <laughs> yeah. So design, build, test, deploy, right? We're all pretty familiar with this. Um, at the beginning of that is what we're what we call strategic planning and analysis. And this is oops, this is a, a this is where I love to work. This is great, uh, great stuff. This is the you know upfront assessment. Why are we doing this? Uh, should we do this? What are we addressing? What are our business drivers? What are we setting out to achieve? Understanding what are the costs and the benefits associated with taking this on? Um, how long will it take us to do this? What's the payback period? When do I start seeing my benefits? Um, and then assessing that feasibility and risk. And so when you look at this, I should have said in the beginning, this is what a business analyst is doing throughout the life cycle of a project. And there's a lot of words on this, and I could have put a lot more on here, but I just kind of highlighted a, a few points that we could fit here. But this is meant to illustrate that there's a lot that happens up front, but then the business analyst doesn't go away. The business analyst is totally engaged with stakeholders, the business, technology, being that liaison, all the way through. And when you get to the end, and you're in measure and reinforce is what I like to call that phase where you're now, you're live, you, you know, it's fantastic, you're using this great new system, things are better than they ever were before. Oh my God. Now, that on that program. <laughs> you're measuring it, right? And you're reinforcing it. And what I mean by reinforcing it is you're actually looking ahead as a visionary, as a business analyst, knowing what the business is thinking and what technology is offering and saying, what can I be doing to drive continuous improvement, whether it be people, processes, or technology. And we always go back to those three. So, and one thing that I, I don't know if I wanted to say here, but I will, because it's top of mind. Also, you know, sometimes we think, all right, we've got this five-year strategy, right, for my department, and this is what the leadership has set out, and this is what we're gonna do and achieve in the next five years. And so there's like, you know, bullet points of things that we're going to do. We're going to become more efficient in this department. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to implement this solution. What a business analyst can help do is actually turn that around a little bit and drive what the next strategy is going to look like. Because you know what's happening on the ground in terms of what the business is doing and thinking, what the citizens need, um, and what technology is offering as it is continually improving. And so if you can bring those things together, you're actually then aligning your strategy of your department, your agency, the state, with what technology is delivering and what the business needs. And I think that's really key. So anyway, this was meant to illustrate, you can take this away with you, um, what the, uh, you know, what, what are the different things around. And you'll see some of these I've repeated because it's important to know that, again, this is iterative and you'll be redoing or going back and, and revisiting some of these uh, items and critical points as you move along the, uh, the implementation of the timeline. Um, that's all I have here. This next one, so if you look at the other side, it's basically taking this first box, strategic planning and analysis, and it's kind of putting a magnifying glass on it and drilling down even further and breaking it into, you know, what happens in that first green box, right? So assessing business needs, again, defining those goals and objectives, you're identifying those stakeholders, you're doing what we call a stakeholder impact assessment, you're figuring out how is this gonna impact the people that are um, actually gonna use the solution or support the solution. Then you move to collecting and analyzing those requirements, you're documenting those, the as is, and your 2B processes, what is this gonna look like in the future? You're, again, you're assessing that feasibility and risk. And then in the end, before you move to execution, you're able to provide input as a business analyst to the program roadmap so that you know this is the scope, this is the baseline requirements, this is how long it's gonna to take to get there, this is what the change, uh, 
change curve is going to look like and how we're going to have to move across that. Um, and then you have here these stakeholder checkpoints, right? So not meant to be literal, but just the key is you're going to have these checkpoints in with your stakeholders. So they're continually engaged. They know where the program's going. They're influencing where the program's going, and they're, pro they're providing input. And you're always going back and validating. Are we still on track? Are we still on track? Are we still meeting that business need? And I, let me just tag on to that this for a minute. Um, this is the part where I said a lot of times business analysts struggle because people want to skip over a piece. This is the piece people want to skip over. This is the piece that people say, we already did all of that. So this is the piece you definitely do not want to skip over because this is where you get the chance to really get on the same page and make sure that everybody understands what is it that we're driving for, especially if you have a project team. Let everybody see the solution. I can't tell how many times I've gone to a project and the people who are building the solution were never in the demos. They never saw what was actually purchased versus the really fancy one that the vendor showed them with all the things you didn't purchase. Um, so this is the time when you get to get people on the same page. And if you don't do that, you have already set up different languages and different understanding from the very beginning. So this is this usually takes us what? 12 weeks? Yes. Depending on the program. But this is not a huge, long process. This is not a year and a half. This is a quick getting on the same page. And Nina often says, you need to go slow to go fast. Yes. I, I always say, go fast to go slow, but then that's wrong. <laughs> go slow to go fast. This is the point where you really want to do this. It will save you immense time later on. Get everybody on the same page. Thank you. That was a lot, right? That was a lot of information. So this is a, another fun. exercise. It should be on the back side of your colored block um, page. Um, this is a kind of little case study, um, and I'll let you read it, but, as, well, maybe I'll read it. No, I'm not going to read it. You can all read it. Um, gives you an example of a situation that may have occurred somewhere, and some complications, so it's not unlike programs or projects in reality. And what I'd like you to do at your table is read through the case, read through the complications, and then once your team is ready, answer these three questions or discuss amongst yourself. What are the business goals for this project? What do you still need to know that you can't tell from the information that you have? And if it was you and you were responsible for that first piece, and in fact, can you go back one slide? If you were responsible for this, okay, how would you, how would you get started on that process? If you have questions, Nina and I are both going to walk around and turn off our microphone. Um, let's let's discuss a little bit. We can. This is the kind of thing that you actually. Anybody ever hit a problem like this or a challenge like this or a set of constraints like this? Because I know I have. Um, so when you look at it from your group, what did you see as business goals? What are the business goals that you can readily identify? Okay, so reducing costs by 50% in five years. What else? Improve services. Improve service levels. Hold the cost of tuition steady. Okay, are they going to be able to hold the cost of tuition steady? Is there a way that they could tie what they're doing to tuition? If they can justify the cost of the back office is what is fed into the cost of tuition. So if they, in fact, did a business case and hardwired their savings, in other words, sucked it out, they actually could hardwire that. That's obviously not a simple business case, and I'll let Nina say whatever she wants to say about that. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, that's the challenge, right? Can you, can you hardwire it is a term that we sometimes use um, to really uh, measure that and then hold true to that and then reduce a budget by that amount or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. So so while this might not actually reduce tuition, what is that piece of information? Because that's an important piece of information. It's a want. Well, it, okay, it's a want, and it's also something that maybe your stakeholder group would care about. So um, a lot of times people that work in university systems are very passionate about education. They like people to be able to keep affording it. So that's the kind of thing that may be important in your communication, getting back to that lever. It may be the kind of lever that you can help to pull or look at. We have saved this much in this area, which we can turn back into tuition or support 
in other parts of the university. What else? What other um, business goals are there? Any others? Okay. What don't you know? What do you still need to know? Why they're not going with the ERP solution already in place? Okay. Available. So the context. Right, so what, what, what's driving that decision right. making? Why are they driving for that? I heard business needs. Mm -hmm. You need to know what the business needs are. What's driving this? Why, mm -hmm. like, like she said, why are they not meeting their needs? Mm -hmm. why, why are they looking into the cloud solution? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the ERP system and this cloud solution that they're looking for? Has anybody run across a situation similar to that with end users seeing a solution? It might not be a cloud solution, but they find some fancy, shiny widget, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's on my phone. I can do it at night while I'm sleeping. I don't even, it's just a big red button. I come in and push it in the morning. It's perfect. Um, that, those are challenging. Is that a business need? Okay. Is it absolutely not a part of the solution? Right. Right, it's not, it's not, it's not black or white here. You're going to have to kind of piece that out. So what else don't you know, or do you need to know, as you step into um, this effort? You've been assigned as a business analyst. What else do you need to know? What's the requirements? requirements? Who the customers are? The requirements. The requirements from where? The from business. those back office functions. From the back office. Yeah, Any other requirements that you might want to know about? Mandates. Budget. Laws. Budget. What what's Resource. coming? Mandates. Any any laws or mandates that govern? Oh, laws, mandates that govern. Yes, absolutely. Because when you get into university systems and so on, you get into all kinds of uh, personally identifiable information, and you also get into federal funds for student aid, and so there's all kinds of laws about that that have to be followed to the letter. What else do you need to know? We also need to know the current, IT, the current IT infrastructure there to know what you take, what, what technology you take, what you take. Yeah, so there's all kinds of business things you need to know. There are also important IT things. So when you are looking at a solution like this, it's not enough just to have the business side of it. What's the, there's an important piece in here that I heard a couple of teams talking about uh, that's, that's very IT. This one, what's, what's that mean? Anybody, can anybody decode, as a part of the statewide inter enterprise architecture strategy, there's a drive to use existing solutions. Why would a state do that? It's shared services. It's you leverage what you've already bought and paid for. And users add it into the mix and save money. Absolutely. So I've actually seen in a different state, not the state, but in another state, where they're, they, the university systems had decided that they had to have a completely different way of doing HR because they were so unique. Has anybody had an end user that's unique? <laughs> is it just me? So they were so unique because the way that they did HR was so unique because HR is so unique and also payroll. It was so unique because payroll is so unique. Um, and I remember it was a statewide university system. And by the way, I, it's unbelievable, but in that state, they had an HR system that paid people who worked for the state and actually they had a whole HR system and it was there, but they weren't as unique apparently. After going through a whole process, lo and behold, they could use the existing system. Years, it took years to get through and, and kind of go down that track. But it saves millions and millions of dollars, which by the way, they can put into their university system in a different way. Okay, anything else you need to know? Benchmark, so so what are your metrics? How are we gonna know that we're successful? I mean, those those things are good to start knowing at the beginning. We'll be. Identify um, when they say internal and external customers, you have to know what that means to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, other processes, you know, other using you talk about before. Go into other compartments and see what they're doing. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. Even really though they're like radically unique. <laughs> Uh, your your comments about benchmarking is uh, is great. Um, it's a point that I totally missed here, and I think it's one that we should uh, just briefly talk about. It is important to know uh, what the benchmark is, both your internal performance today, uh, so that you can measure against that as you improve. It's also interesting to look at benchmarks of other uh, comparable entities. So it might be other states. Uh, you might look at uh, benchmarking of 
you know, how they do uh, their procurement or purchasing uh, for supplies and uh, what, what are some of the benchmarks to measure that. Um, and then it's also sometimes interesting for public service organizations to look at private sector benchmarks as well. Uh, you know, purchasing is top of mind, so you think about state of California, big entity, a lot of buying power. Um, how does Walmart do it? You know, how can you leverage that buying power? How can you procure better? Or even if you're talking about school districts, how can school districts, large school districts, buy together? If you look at benchmarks, you're able to measure that and figure out how could we perform even better. So that's great. Yeah, and one of the things I love about working in government, in public sector, is that people will share that information with you. So someone who's done it well is very happy to say, this is how we did it, this is what we learned, this is where we hit the wall and won't ever do that again. Um, and that's invaluable. And, and some, some organizations that are private will as well. So it's, in, it's incredibly good to add that in. Anything else that you don't know? Yeah. I would like to know why 50% if we can go through everything and only do 30% in the next five years, will the project still go, go forward? Or is that an absolute mandate? So is it the great question. Like, what's that metric for success? And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's like, let's say it's 50%. If you got to 30%, it might not be the end of the world. So knowing that at the beginning, I don't know. Well, I would want to keep them. I'd tell them it was 50%. Or if I wanted 50%, I'd have 70 Because <laughs> I lie. Um, what else do you need to know? Do you know everything that you need to know? How are things done now? And I think the other thing to remember is you never know everything that you need to know. And I think if you keep that in, in mind, that's a really yeah. important thing. Anything else like that? Okay. How do you get started on that first part? What are you gonna do? You're you're the business analyst, you've been assigned, what are you gonna do? Identify stakeholders. Uh, that was a lot of <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> okay, what else? You've identified your stakeholders, what else do you need to do? What's happening today? How much time are you going to spend on it? Well, Come on. Just Come on. Enough to know what to just enough. That's right. Don't spend all like don't spend months and months going in now what do you then you get called to so okay, but put that on the wall. <laughs> then what? What else what else are you gonna do? Don't make me wait. Because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> what must you have? Okay. What must you have? Assess the stakeholders. Okay, how's this change going to impact my stakeholders? Okay. Okay. So you have a little guy. Gap analysis between the existing solutions that we're supposed to use are awesome. already out there yes. against the business need, and then if there's a real strong driver to the cloud solution, why is that a driver? How many people are on board for that? How many people, what's the cloud behind the people that are on board for that? Yes. So, you know, what's their authority level? And that there is a lot of push for that, then sure. measure that against the business need, look at the gaps between that and the business, um, and the other solutions that already might meet the need 70%. Yep. Right. So getting that and getting your getting your end users involved in that because they may not know what's possible. And when you're doing a solution like this, if you have an existing, you know, if they have an enterprise architecture strategy that's going and you have solutions, get someone in who can really make it work well. Make so that end user can see it. Don't get somebody in who does a real technical demo. Get somebody in who can really help people see. Look, this is how you could use this. Let's and make it look so that I could understand if I work in a particular division. Okay, this looks like my universe. Let me understand it, um, because obviously it's, they're looking at something new and shiny. The new and shiny is always going to people will spend time making it look really just like you. It looks really good. So getting that view. The other thing that I would say is you want to look at the cost as you're doing that analysis. What's the cost? of using the existing solution versus the cost of bringing in a new solution, both at the beginning and then over time. So there's, for those of you who aren't technical, the cost at the beginning is oftentimes the little cost, and the cost over time is connecting it to everything else that it has to connect to and passing the information correctly and getting all the reports accurate. That's the big cost, so look at the cost of those two things. And, and educate your end users, because they don't know that when they're looking at something that's like, like, I don't know when I go in sometimes to buy something technical and I just want it. Um, 
and then I find out I have to like rewire the whole network at home. You also have to identify risks. Yes. Okay. Risks. Good. Good. Especially using a cloud solution for HR information. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So you so have my right. with that. I said that's what's right. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nope. All right. So now we're going to stop talking and so on and open it up for questions for people who'd like to ask questions. Um, oh, we have a couple more slides. Wait, I'm done. <laughs> oh, yes, wrapping it all up. Sorry. <laughs> just to wrap it all up. So the, just to summarize, this, if you thought of this as the curriculum and you were, you were going to business analyst school, these are some of the courses. This today was business analysis 101. It's like that. And that undergraduate course that you take and you think, oh my gosh, I know everything about it, but then you find out later that there's a course for everything that you spent like one day on. <laughs> right. This is, these are all the different areas that we covered today, or, and it is not everything about business analysis, but if you have an opportunity, it sounds like you're going to have an opportunity in the state to participate in an academy. Um, these are the kinds of courses you want to look for. Um, and it's really an awesome opportunity, I thought, when I heard about that. Um, to really kind of think about where are the places that you want to focus your energy. There are, as Nina said, there are whole books written about all of these things. There are classes that you can take online. Some of them are freely available. Um, but definitely look and see what are the pieces that really you, you need to focus on because you haven't worked on before, or what are the areas that you're really passionate about and you'd like to learn more about? Because there's opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Nina can tell you all about that. Um, so I think you know we could talk about all of these, but we already have. So let's just talk about a couple of them. Measuring success. This is something that people often will push back on. How can I possibly know that? Start measuring. You will be wrong at first. Just choose your metric as you get started. Choose a metric and say, OK, we're going to do x. And then as you work in your program a little bit and you measure against it, you go, you know what? That metric's not quite right. What we need to be measuring is this. And you'll, your metric will get better as you go on. Um, we talked about um, aligning your strategy and business um, and being sure that everybody's on the same page and really understanding what are the business drivers for this effort. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think we've touched on all of these points and um, you know, Michelle and I are going to be at the booth, at the Accenture booth downstairs in that main plenary area today. So I know I heard some great questions around the room, so if you, you guys want to come out and uh, talk to us. We really appreciate it. We have some great water bottles too. We do have fabulous giveaways. We also have screen cleaners for those of you that have dirty uh, applications. Yeah, I've got cleaners and stuff. So anyway, um, so yeah. So if you want to, you know, if you want to ask a question here, we're we're happy to address those. Or if you want to come see us um, afterwards, too. Yeah. But thank so, you so yeah. much. We appreciate so, it. Yeah. Thank you. And if there are questions, we can yeah, like we can take them. We can take some questions. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wasn't my sign, sorry. <laughs> um, any any questions? All right, so hopefully, yes. Uh, I have to step out, so if you already covered this, I apologize, but is this event will be made available to us? Yep. All of the slides for the programs today will be made available, and I'm not sure exactly how, but they will be, and if you come by the booth, I'll find out, and you can ask. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you very much.